Hi, uh, Luce Ghost here. Uh, just real quick before we begin, this video was recorded uh, live on my Twitch channel while I was grinding for an item in Terraria. If you hear any like zombie noises, that's, that's probably what that is. It was a bit of an experiment to see what a live video essay would be like. If it's a bit different to the kind of video essays you've seen before, you know, pacing wise or whatever, that's why. I hope you enjoy anyway. And um, yeah, I hate long rambling intros, so here we go. That was the fifth take on that. The first three times I forgot to record the audio. I hope everyone's had a nice weekend. I have um, spent my entire weekend on the Brave Little Toaster. I got the clipboard out for this. I rewatched it on Saturday, but I've also just watched a bunch of clips and I've, I've done I've done some studying up. So just bear with me, people. We will get started soon. I didn't even consider that the Terraria aspect of this might be a huge problem. This could be a huge clusterfuck crime, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to talk about the Brave Little Toaster. I'm going to go through the film with you guys. I'm going to play bits of it and hopefully not get fucking banned. Oh my God. I'm immensely stressed right now. <laughs> Let's take a look, right? I'm gonna be going into like a lot of the themes and stuff in this movie because I think there's some interesting stuff. This movie was brought up a lot in that YouTube trend of here's things from kids movies that traumatized me as a child. We will be getting into those scenes. I think about three scenes that always get brought up in this movie. It's the air conditioning at the beginning. Again, we'll, we'll get to all this. So if you know what the fuck I'm talking about, we will get to it. Firefighter scene. And I'm not telling you what's, uh, like, these might sound weird uh, because I'm purposefully leaving out what's scary about them so that I can tell you later. And the junkyard scene. These are three big scenes that get brought up a lot when talking about this movie because they are fucking scary. One in particular, the air conditioning. I used to hide behind the sofa during that scene because it frightened me that much. The reason I want to talk about this movie is because people bring up how scary those scenes are, but they don't seem to bring up how dark the entire fucking movie is. The writer of this film treated these characters like humans, they're not, they're not just, they're not just personified appliances. They're like treated like actual characters and they have their own personalities and everything and react to things like, like real people would. They're in this world that let's be honest, if you're a fucking toaster, probably not that great, but that's why I want to talk about this movie. It's not just like, oh, when you think about it, this is kind of dark. It's like, no, the writer and director made this movie dark on purpose. Jerry Reese is his name, I should point that out. Um, he made this movie dark, he wanted it to be dark. This is the opening shot. Spooky tree, and it brings up two things that I really wanna focus on, the themes. There's a lot of themes, right, that I've got planned. You see nature and you see darkness, and these two things are used quite a lot in this movie. Uh, let's have a look at some of these characters. Here's the toaster, there you go, lovely shot. Look at the little fella. Something I should address is the genders for these characters are kind of kind of confusing to talk about because they're a toaster, a vacuum cleaner, a radio, an electric blanket, and a lamp. They, they are literally objects, so they don't have a gender. And in the book that this film is based off, they just referred to as it, I'm pretty sure. The toaster has become kind of like a LGBTQ icon. It's like ambiguous in gender, so it's referred to as no male, but uh, the director thinks of the toaster as female. And in fact, the voice actor for the toaster didn't realize she was voicing a male character either. Also, a lot of the characters in this flip genders in different countries, in different languages. So we're, I'm gonna try and really just refer to the appliances as it, because that's, I think what the book does. I feel like that's right. And the toaster is warm and friendly and fucking brave. Although we'll, we'll get to that because it's not just the toaster that's brave, everyone's brave. But the toaster's warm and friendly in the heart of the group and it's a toaster. It provides food, provides sustenance and it's an important part of the group. And it's just what the film's named after. This is Lamp, is he called Lampy? Yeah, Lampy. Uh, so this is Lamp, it's kind of uh, ironic actually, kind of a dumb character despite being bright. Uh, it's very sarcastic as well, kind of grumpy but not super grumpy. 
uh, almost a little mean to some of the other characters. Doesn't get on super well with them. But yeah, it's it's a bit cynical. Not not super cynical. <laughs> There's another character to talk about, but cynical. Let's go to Kirby. Where's Kirby? Kirby is this guy. Kirby is incredibly cynical and grumpy. Uh, <laughs> almost like a Sundere character. He acts like he hates all the other ones, but I, I, don't, I don't think he really does. So this is the only character that's not really named after what it is. Uh, you know, there's lamp, radio, toaster, blankie, blanket, and Kirby, who is a vacuum. But I think it's a brand of vacuum cleaners. And I think both Kirby, the video game character, and Kirby, the vacuum cleaner, are named after the same thing. I think they're both named after a brand of vacuum. Um, but yeah, this fucking grumpy guy, he's like the elder of the group, he's the most cynical. On the cusp of, like, losing all hope. <laughs> Which, uh, over something that I'll get to in a minute. This is the radio. Now, I fucking love the radio. Radio is by far my favorite character in the whole film. Uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll go with that. I'm going to risk scrolling down a little there. I do not want to find out that there's rule 34 of this movie. Radio is kind of the comic relief of the movie. Uh, his whole thing is that he's constantly like tells lies. He makes shit up. He says he did things that he didn't do. Which might make you think like, oh, what a dick, you know, making up all this shit. But he's a radio. He tells stories. That's what he does. That's his characterization. That's, that's really all there is to radio. Because radio is kind of treated as just a comic relief character. It doesn't really get too much. It has a few kind of moments in the film, which I think are a little bit emotional, maybe. Or not emotional, but a little bit dark. But radio is really there to just lighten the mood. Blanky is the youngest of the group. We don't know really physically how it's blanky. <laughs> blanky. Oh. oh, blanky. The Bob is literally like treated as a child and acts like a child, voice like a child. So, although we don't know how old all the appliances are, blanky is definitely meant to be the youngest, meant to be the baby of the group. Kind of emotionally neglected in a way and feels really like left behind. Kind of needy because it's a blanket, it needs someone cuddling it the entire purpose and childish because a, like a little blanket not a lot of people have that growing up it's really only something kids would have so blanky is the needy kind of child of the group cries a lot gets really upset very very emotional character oh there is another character we're talking about and that is the master so all the appliances belong to the master and they live in what i think is like a holiday cottage for this family and they've been there for years and the family hasn't been there and they're all missing the master. They haven't seen him in a long time. And they're all sort of responding to it in different ways. Lanky is like super hopeful that he's going to come back all the time. Uh, Kirby, the vacuum cleaner, has kind of given up. That's what I mean by cynical, right? He's basically like, no, it's not happening. The master's left us. He's not coming back. We all need to just kind of move on and get on with it. And everyone's sort of in different stages of like convinced. And it is the toaster and Blanky that are most like hit by the fact that uh, their master isn't coming back. And I think that's interesting, and I'll tell you why, right? If you look at these appliances, there's something that the toaster and Blanky have in common more so than any of the others. And that's that they need the master there to perform their function. They, they've been in this house completely on their own, mind you, for years now, and they haven't been able to perform their function. The toaster can't make toast. No one's putting fucking toast in it. There's not gonna be food there either. And the blanket's function is literally to be close to and, and cuddle in a person. The lamp can still light, the radio can still play the radio, and the hoover uh, can still hoover shit up. But the blanket and the toaster can't. So they have been stuck in this cabin with no master, hence no function, no purpose for a long time. I think we should probably get into the actual film now. That's the setup of the movie, that's where it starts. This is the first shot of the toaster, the titular character. We see it in anime, right? It's not doing anything, it's not got eyes. It's a really nice painting, the artwork in this film is great. Uh, but what we see is a reflection of the sunlight in this toaster, and I think that kind of reflects on the character. Light is a big theme in this film, as well as darkness, and so are reflections. It's pretty obvious what light represents, you know, it's fucking hope and everything. And it definitely is in this case, and I'm pretty sure like it's quite explicit later on. This isn't just me being like all classic English teacher. Darkness represents obsolescence, right? It represents these characters 
no longer being used. And that is the biggest theme of this film is these appliances or any appliances becoming obsolete, useless. We see the light reflecting in the toaster and we see the reflection a lot because the toaster is literally characterized by positivity and the opposite of obsolescence. And we see the characters all motionless just in the cabin on their own in the darkness funny enough and the film starts with the, the light coming in it starts with in a moment lampy lights up it brings them all to life it, it, it doesn't literally bring them to life like they don't die if they're in the darkness but the darkness to me kind of represents them out of use being useless being forgotten the first thing we see then of uh, each appliance as characters when they are awake now when they're moving is them doing their function the lamp lights something up the radio plays the radio and the hoover finds a little speck of dust that comes out of the air conditioner we'll get to him he hoovers it up the first thing we see these characters is them performing their function to me that's like the reason why those three characters in particular aren't that desperate to get back to the master whereas the toaster and blanky can't really let the master go and then we have this really fun upbeat sequence where the radio plays some music Blanky is cleaning the, the walls and everything, which is kind of sad because it's like, that's not the Blanky's function. He's operating outside his function. And uh, something you see, which is quite interesting, I just want to focus on this because it's a cool detail. If you look in the background there on the wall, you can see a clear split where the wall gets really dirty. And that's because that's as high as Blanky can reach cleaning the walls. It can't reach any higher than that. And throughout the entire house, you see this. And then suddenly the music fades out and it cuts to Blanky doing this, staring off into nowhere and you don't know what's wrong at first and then Blanky whispers Gah. and everyone goes nuts they pick up all the furniture they stack it up so they can get into the attic you know they've been really careful and cleaning but now all of a sudden there's a car they climb up into the attic so Blanky can see and Blanky sees this car it says it's the master it's the master this person that they haven't seen in years uh the hoover at this point says it's been 2000 days they are so stir crazy and nothing's going on that they abandon everything <laughs> and make a huge mess just because there's a car. And then suddenly the palette changes to this and we have a sequence. There's the master. Blankies whose eyes go from little dot eyes. Let me see if I can show you. Little dot eyes like that uh, to, the, to this fucking thing and goes floating down the stairs. And the master comes in and hugs and you can see everything's gold and shiny and everything's cool now. In the middle of this really happy sequence, boom, music cuts out. It cuts to the car driving away. It's not the master, they were wrong. And it is a gut punch. Blanky starts wailing. It's really, really sad. It's genuine, like, it sounds like actual fucking crying. It's interestingly, Blanky is voiced by a child and they called the child One Take Timmy because they got all of their lines right first time. They never had to reshoot anything, apparently. It's this happy dream sequence and then boom, it snaps right away to reality. It's brutal and there's a lot of moments like that. They stack everything away, they're miserable, Blanky cries, and then they fight over this picture and it smashes. That's the master. And we see this. I'm going to play this. <laughs> and that is the air conditioner a character you'll notice i haven't actually brought up yet he is just needlessly cruel he basically says you're all stupid you're all delusional the master's never coming back he's left us you should give up hope because he's given up hope oh there you look how creepy his fucking face is at this point the the hoover kirby has been saying yeah, just give up. The master's not coming back. The master's not coming back. But when the air conditioner says, you're all stupid, the master's not coming back. He says, how do you know? Have you spoken to him lately? And he sort of joins the group. And that sort of tells me like, he's just acting tough. The air conditioner has lost all hope. But this guy's a realist. Uh, and we are getting into a scene now, which I have to play in full and just hope for the best. Because this scene is the one that terrified me as a kid. They tell the air conditioner, you're just bitter because the master never wanted to play with you because you're stuck in the wall. Just because you can move around, you think you're better than I am. 
I'm not an invalid. I was designed to stick in a wall. I like being stuck in this stupid wall. I can't help it if the kid was too short to reach my dials. We didn't mean it. Really? It's my function! Don't! Wait! Wait! I'm behind the sofa at this point. In real life, watching this film. I'm hiding behind the fucking sofa. He blows himself up. He loses his fucking mind. By the way, that voice actor, uh, you may have recognized him, although it's hard because he's shouting. That is uh, Phil Hartman, the voice actor of Lionel Hutz and uh, Troy McClure from The Simpsons. That's what we fucking see of the air conditioner now. He blows himself up. No wonder the kid never played with him. Actually, you do want to remember this. Please remember this. But it's not his fault the kid was too short to reach his dials. Uh, which is like, well, I don't know, he got up on the counter for the toasters. And that's sort of the spectrum we see. Blanky, who is delusionally hopeful, all the way to the air conditioner, who is delusionally hopeless. I mean, he refers to them all as scrap metal, I think, as well. It's worth noting. He, he says that they're all basically scrap metal at this point. And we skip forward a bit. Yeah, so basically, what we end up seeing almost immediately after, uh, is this serene shot of the cottage because they hear someone driving up again. There's no dream sequence this time. You know, they've already been gut punished once. They hear someone coming. They hear a knocking outside. And what they see is this. There you go. It's a for sale sign. I.e. That's it for us. This is essentially the catalyst that gets them. Well, they're all, you know, here they're miserable. Lamp is just sad. He's sort of pushed over the other edge. I'm pretty sure Radio is trying to put on a brave face. He's still trying to entertain everyone. And that's the general consensus of uh, the group after that moment. The toaster jumps on this box here in the spotlight while everyone else is stood in the darkness, just resigned to their fate and tries to convince everyone not to lose hope. The Radio says, Hang on a second, I heard a news story the other day. A puppy got lost when its owner was on holiday and traveled across the country and got back to its owner. Maybe we could do that. The, the appliances move out of the darkness of the cottage into the spotlight. Out of the darkness of being, you know, cast aside, obsolete, thrown away, and into the light of hope, uh, into the, you know, light that's shining off the toaster. What do we see in the darkness? staying in the cottage and not going out to find the master i'm not even going to fucking explain it because you can see that right there right it's by far one of the creepiest moments of this film for me this isn't so much something thematic i want to talk about this is more something that bugs me about this film what the fuck is up with that fridge it's not alive isn't that a bit weird the vacuum gets to be alive the air conditioner gets to be alive so if the air conditioner is alive, then it means that being stationary doesn't disqualify you. The toaster is food related. Why is this fridge not alive? Later in the movie, we see lamps, like ceiling lamps that are alive. So maybe it's just that they didn't bother personifying the fridge because they didn't want another character in the cottage. Or maybe they are genuinely trying to imply that all these other appliances have given up and died. However, Later on in the film, they kind of do establish that just because you've given up all hope doesn't mean you die. These appliances, even when they're no longer being used and haven't been used in a long, long time, they're still alive. So it's probably not that. It's probably just that they couldn't be bothered to put a character in, which is fair enough. We go then, they, they do eventually find a way uh, to, to get out of the cottage and it's using this chair, they get a battery. <laughs> I love this shot of the toaster, it's great. They move out literally into a bright thing of light. I'm not just fucking making this shit up. The light is definitely a theme. We get the first song of the movie, which I will play. Time fly by in the city of light. Time stands still in the country. <laughs> also, there's no time for a person of light. It's this really cheerful, happy song, and it's called City of Light and they refer to the city they're going to where their master is as the city of light. It makes sense, their appliances, electricity and light are, you know, pretty closely linked. 
really, I don't think there's too much to talk about other than they're talking about how great it is. Uh, they say the master is a man with a plan I can understand. The master is a man of great reflection. There's reflection again. But they're just like excited to get to the City of Light. They say they'll be satisfied to be not denied and to reside with some pride while I ride to the City, the City of Light. They're really excited to get to the City of Light. What is worth talking about is what happens immediately at the end of the song. I wonder if the YouTube video will show it. <laughs> oh, we actually also, for a little bit here, we find out how the vacuum empties itself. Uh, or rather, that the vacuum ending itself is kind of allegorical for it taking a, a shit. So I think like the idea of the appliances being at odds with nature, you know, they're not meant to be out here in the middle of nowhere. They're meant to be in a home with people. And we see, you know, Blanky gets covered in all these knots, uh, all these like st sticky bits. They fight each other with a rock. Kirby is constantly getting his bag clogged up by all the, the twigs and stuff. No one wants Blanky near them, not even the toaster. Uh, the toaster fucking rejects Blanky here, which is fucking brutal. They make it through the thicket and they end up in this beautiful place. And there's all these animals and they all have fun. They mess around with the toaster's reflection. All the mice hang out over Blanky, which is really cute. Uh, there's a whole musical number. It's great. But then the toaster gets freaked out because they're obsessed with this reflection. And the toaster meets this flower. This is a very important scene. So there's fields of flowers everywhere, but this flower's on its own. All this, by the way, is backed up uh, by the director, what I'm about to say. I'm not just making shit up. The flower sees its reflection in the toaster and falls in love with it and tries to hug, but the toaster says, I'm, well, I'm not a flower, and then runs away, and we see this. There you go. And uh, that's what we see. Something that is important, and the, the director brought this up in an interview, is the color of the flower is more or less the same color yellow as Blanky. And when the toaster sees this flower wilting, it thinks of Blanky and thinks, ah, oh, I, you know, Blanky's wilting as well because we've been pushing it away. And then Blanky is getting dragged underground by these mice and the toaster saves it. There you go. These mice are dragging Blanky underground and toaster saves it. From that moment on, the toaster and Blanky have like a special connection. And we go into this spooky forest. Uh, there you go, darkness again. Here we are, darkness and nature. The lamp is lighting the way, that's lovely. <laughs> this, this fucking terrifying tree, which I mentioned this earlier, but the director said the whole point of this film and the way they treat these characters is that the world they're in is, is scary for them. Just why it's so dark. They don't know what's out here. This isn't their natural, well, that's scarier. This isn't their natural habitat. This isn't where they belong. So everything's scary. And here we have Lampy asks the toaster, what's the deal with you and Blanky? And the toaster just explains that it makes him feel warm to help Blanky. The lamp tells a story of when his bulb went out and he thought, that's it for me. I'm going to get thrown out. It's over. My, I can't do my function anymore. And his bulb is replaced by the master, which characterizes the master excellently. He doesn't throw these appliances away, you know, he fixes them. I know anyone would fix a bulb, but the fact that this is one of the few things we see their master do is really important. That's his biggest fear, essentially. That's all their biggest fear, really. No longer being used. That's all they want is to be used. They don't want to be cast aside for being broken or obsolete. I'll be real with you. In the next scene, the battery breaks, and that's what I want to talk about. But before, we have to address... This fucking scene, because this is the scene everyone talks about. This is the scene that everyone goes, this scared me when I was a kid. And uh, I don't even remember it. I don't remember watching it as a kid. We see a dream sequence of the master getting toast from toaster and the toaster malfunctions and a bunch of smoke comes out of it. This fucking happens. The toaster is also afraid of, like, breaking, but the toaster's afraid of harming the master with, with, with breaking. Or maybe afraid that it's been so long since it was used that it's no longer going to be able to perform its function. And this is the bit that freaks everyone out. Not that. This. Because fuck that. <laughs> and it seems to me that 
the toaster is afraid of malfunctioning, but not because it would be obsolete, more so that it would be harmful to the master. It's been useless for so long, you know? That's what I think is going on. He's also then chased by a bunch of forks, and we see another theme of water. These appliances are generally afraid of water throughout this film. And like, I mean, here's a toaster plugged in, hanging above a bath. That's literally death for a toaster and for anyone in the bath with it. But yeah, it has a nightmare and they wake up to this storm. Blanky gets blown away and uh, Lampy is trying to find it. Then the battery that they're bringing with them dies out. And so Lampy plugs itself into the battery, gets on the chair, gets hit by lightning to recharge the battery. <laughs> There's Lampy dying on the floor, broken bulb, completely worn out. Still alive. Don't worry. Not dead. Sorry if that uh, fooled some of you. <laughs> but yeah, Lampy's biggest fear uh, was breaking, getting the ball broke out, and faces it anyway. Bryony, my fiancé, watched this with me on Sunday and thought that Lampy was dead. <laughs> Not much else to this scene. And then we find another scene that freaked me out personally as a kid. He sees the water here in the waterfall and starts freaking out. There you go. He starts eating his own cord, which you see here. And they have to like pull the cord out of his, his mouth. But he's still alive. But yeah, he freaks out and eats his own cord. It's It scared the shit out of me as a kid, and I don't know why. But that's, there's not much else to talk about in this scene. Other than this precarious attempt at like jumping over the waterfall. Kirby is at the top, and then goes away, and jumps into the water after them. He, Kirby does manage to save them all, which is kind of cool. Uh, they come ashore and the happy music just cuts out immediately and they, they don't know where the fuck they are. They're in this boggy, marshy wasteland, which is weird to me because they didn't know where they were anyway. Kirby falls into the mud and they all get dragged down into this mud while they're still alive. And we have another moment which fucking terrifies me. <laughs> What the fuck is that? I'm not scared. And I don't know what it is about that, but that fucking terrifies me. Literal child, right? That's, that's a child. That's, it's a fucking child. Last moments of life, reassuring the toaster, I'm not scared. That's what I mean by this film being a lot darker than people take it, and by maybe even a lot of kids' films, and that this moment here is treated so genuinely with like, genuine reactions from the characters and it's these kind of reactions that make this film to me feel a lot more mature and a lot more dark than it actually looks they do get picked up by this guy elmo saint peters and he <laughs> gets into this huge fucking monster truck which kills me and he takes them to his little shop we meet this guy we'll get to that they replace, uh, they replace Lampy's bulb as well, which is really nice. We see a guy come into the store and ask, do you have any blender motors? And the, uh, Elmo St. Peter says, yeah, we had a whole shipment of blender motors come in just this morning. We then see this happen. Fucking Elmo St. Peter's grabs a screwdriver. We see in the shadows, he chops up the fucking blender. Look at that. It's a fucking nightmare. Is this Sid from Toy Story? Crag. Wow. Beautiful question. This film was started by a man called John Lasseter. Got fired off this film because he wanted to do it half CGI, half uh, traditional animation. Disney were like, no, get out of here, which is when Jerry Reese, the director, right, took over. John Lasseter, you might hear his name, uh, then went on to basically i think he created pixar i genuinely believe that this is kind of the prototype for pixar and this film is the first instance of the uh, a113 easter egg that is in every pixar movie they ask you know how, how do we escape how do we escape and <laughs> you see you never quite know what he's going to do uh, this fucking lamp guy comes down and he's terrifying. In this scene, Phil Hartman is doing an impression of Peter Law, who was in a lot of, like, uh, he's, in, he's in a lot of movies, a lot of horror movies. 
and I'm going to play a little clip from it so that you guys can get the general sense of, of what we're after. There's not much substance to it, in my opinion. Uh, it's just a lot of like uh, classic B movie horror references. Uh, towards the end, they say, "Here goes the sun. Here comes the night. Somebody turn on the light." I.e., darkness is coming. What does that mean for them? They're fucking trapped in this creepy fucking chop shop with this terrifying guy, and it's it's nighttime. You know, the the light is going away. The prospect of becoming obsolete and becoming scrap metal is becoming very real for our clients this year. You just tell St. Pete that you got cold feet. You tell St. Pete, St. Peter at the gates of heaven, no thanks, got cold feet. I'm going to stay alive. But do you remember me telling you what this fella's name was? The owner of the shop, his name is Elmo St. Peter, is an obvious reference to Sesame Street where Elmo gets tickled. No, it's not. Uh, it's St. Peter. So, in a way, this guy has stood at the gates of death. The character that says, it ain't home on the range, is an oven, which I'm gonna let you figure that one out yourself. So, they, they sing a song, a creepy song, uh, you're doomed, everything's gonna, everything's horrible, and they are uh, terrifying. This is Joan Rivers. <laughs> Oh, look at them. They're so cool looking. I fucking love the designs of these characters. This is not on the theme of the film, but this is a personal grudge I have. Look at that. Did you, did you see that? Let me go back. Did you? The fridge jumped. It's alive. So tell me, tell me, tell me, Jeff, uh, Jerry Reese, director and writer, of the Brave Little Toaster from 1989 or 7, I always forget. Why is this fridge alive and not the other one? What? And then he comes back looking for radio tubes and he does grab the radio uh, and they need to get him out. So what do they do? They impersonate a ghost and scare the man uh, so that they can escape. Remember what I said earlier about this being like a, a prototype Pixar movie? Right there. That is basically how Toy Story ends. And then they do a jailbreak. The fridge is very clearly alive. St explain, Jerry. That brings up a theme uh, that at this point in the movie is definitely worth addressing and it's consumerism. And like um, more explicitly our like kind of throwaway culture. A little bit anti-capitalist as well. Um, that's, that's how it comes across to me anyway. It's definitely very like consumerist ideals going on there. Uh, it's hurting these appliances. They finally see the city of lights. There we go. That's been talking about since the beginning. Um, but they finally reach the city, uh, the city of lights and we see it, you know, in darkness, but the light is popping out of it, which are, you know, the two major themes I've been pointing out is the, the light, you know, their hope and where they want to go and the darkness being, being thrown away or obsolete or forgotten about. And here we see a dark city that is lit up. It's like to them, nothing can go wrong here. We, where we need to be, this is where we belong. And like for appliances, yeah, you need to be where the people are. You're fucking, your appliances. You need to be switched on and plugged in. I love this here, which is this trail of stars leading into the city. It looks fucking amazing. Now here, here's the thing. This is a bit of a gut punch to me. We finally see the master in present day. And we see not only is he no longer a kid, but he's graduated high school. He's like eight, maybe 10 at the beginning of the film. So we're talking years and years later, a long, long time later. So we realize just how long these appliances have been left in this cottage at the beginning of the film. And it's made even more brutal because during this scene, he is packing to move out of his mother's house. The master here, again, I don't know his actual name, tells his mother that he's gonna go out to the cottage to pick up his old, his old uh, toaster and lamp and radio and all that. Let that fucking sink in. He's going back to the cottage. They've come all this way and risked all that, and he was coming back 
He was always coming back. I'd forgotten about it. So when I watched this film recently, I was like, oh, oh shit. Oh, that's so sad. There's another one of those moments where the film suddenly just goes, ah, here you go. During this scene, the new appliances, these up-to-date uh, cutting-edge appliances, talk about how kind of surprised they are that he's going back to the old appliances. They genuinely feel entitled to the master because they knew they think there's no way you could want the old appliances. And it kind of fits that uh, consumerism theme again. It's almost an unspoken rule in this film that the appliances want to be with the master. And I guess it's because he's younger. It's almost a reversal where the humans want to have the newest appliances and the appliances want to be with the youngest humans. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it feels. Old age and the way we treat elderly people becomes a theme very shortly. Oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, there's a perfect shot of it. There it is. The Pixar Easter egg. This is a famous number that is used in like all Pixar movies num on number plates or doors and stuff. And the reason is it is the classroom in Caltech that they were the, the founders of Pixar. A lot of the animators of Pixar it had classes in. And that includes John Lasseter, obviously, who started this movie. And I believe Jerry Reese as well, the director. They knock the door and the lamp, the new lamp opens. They come in and the, uh, into the master's new home. They finally make it there. And you see them face to face with this brand new up-to-date technology. And the up-to-date technology is all weird and creepy and passive aggressive to them. Uh, this one in particular, she is super mean. How do you do? Blanky. Oh, I love Blanky. And they, they see the master, they see how much he's grown up, it's kind of sad. And they meet the old TV as well, who used to be in the cottage and now got brought to the house, which I think is super interesting. And they're so happy to see the TV, the TV's happy to see them. Kind of weird that they have all this other up-to-date technology for an old TV. But the TV tries to tell them, because you might be thinking like, well, the TV, why didn't you tell them that the master's gone back to the cottage? He tries to, but they fuck with the dials. The master shows Chris, her name might be Chrissy, but um, your first was Chris, is Holiday Home. It's interesting, uh, this is a film made in 1987, released in 89, I believe. Uh, and they're, they're an interracial couple, which I think is like uncommon for that time, but they did it. However, sequels, they lightened her skin. Oof, no good. The master goes through all of his like belongings and freaks out because someone's like made a mess of the place and stolen the appliances and then we get back to the master's house with these creepy fucking guys we are on the cutting edge of technology so this is the song cutting edge and it's basically about these brand new appliances bragging about how great they are to the old appliances more, 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 everything you wanted and more. There we see the fucking consumerism again. I can process words accounting to my pixel screen displays for you. This is a vector display. <laughs> it is not a pixel. It's th these aren't pixels. Minor problem. Minor little problem. The one thing that like probably has occurred to everyone about this song called Cutting Edge that's about these brand new technology. It's ironic because this is incredibly obsolete now. This is, this is old technology, but that was always the plan. It, they were always supposed to seem outdated. But even when this film came out, these appliances were beginning to get old. So the irony of this song was intentional even back then. And I think that's hilarious. The master goes through the house and goes, where's my toaster? Where's my vacuum cleaner? As the new appliances throw them all out of the window into the dumpster. <sighs> and what's about to come, what you're about to see is just very dark and depressing. I'm gonna go to some fairly dark places with it. So I wanna show you this scene in its entirety. We do that. This scene takes place just uh, after what I just talked about. He, re he replays the AC. Isn't that like a nice little moment? He's so happy. 
If you remember, I, I asked you to focus on the line where the AC says, it's not my fault the kid was too short to reach my dials. Not only has the air conditioner been fixed, that's the first time the master ever uses him because he couldn't use him before he was too short. So that's a nice little moment. The appliances get taken to the dump. At least the, the master's so lucky to have new appliances and they genuinely believe that they're not wanted by the master who has just gone to fetch them from the cabin. Now, we're in a junkyard filled with cars. Here is a magnet that takes cars and dumps them into this humanized crusher, which looks like Bender from Futurama. We'll let that sink in for a moment. While we talk about this scene where the master's mother says, you can just take my appliances. But the master says like, you need your appliances. I'll, I'll get some second hand somewhere. <clears throat> and this is where I address why the master is so great. In this film about consumerism, or that, that is largely about consumerism and throwing out all the appliances when you no longer need them, the master is seen repairing appliances, replacing bulbs, and not buying new appliances, but going back to get his old ones because they still work. It's also suggested that Chris, um, his well, girlfriend or his partner, who uh, I don't know who she is to him at this point, but she points out some car parts later in the film, which makes me think like she might be like a mechanic or like a car hobbyist. Which like fits in again, like they're repairing cars instead of throwing them out. But during this scene, this song that plays, during it, it inter intercuts uh, scenes of the TV, trying to convince the master and um, Chris to go to the junkyard. He, he puts up an advert for the junkyard, pretending it's like a, a used appliances store. If you haven't listened to any of the other ones, please fucking listen to this one. Because it rules, first of all. I just can't, I just can't, I just can't seem to get started. Don't have the heart to live in the fast lane. All that is past and gone. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. That fucking line is so fucking important. But essentially what we're seeing here is these cars talking about what they did in their lives as, as they get crushed. Die. They die. We haven't really seen anything die, maybe the blender. The air conditioner looked like it died, but it was brought back to life. But these cars are being crushed into cubes. They are 100% non-debatable, fucking dead. Singing about all the stuff they did in their lives they can't do anymore because they're worthless. That's the, that's the name of the song. First car says, I can't take this kind of pressure. I must confess, one more dusty road would be just a road too long. It's at the end of his life worthless he can't do anything anymore and then he gets crushed it actually stutters says i just can't i just can't i just can't seem to get started much like a car when you try pumping the engine i think that's really good writing uh don't have the heart to live in the fast lane this line all that has passed and gone there ain't nothing you can do about it everyone's gonna die and chances are long time before you die you're gonna worn out not be able to do the things you used to not be able to really do anything anymore. And uh, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Uh, that makes everything else in this film <laughs> seem like baby stuff. I once ran the Indy 500, I must confess. I'm impressed how I did it. I wonder how close that I came. I've had a look and it looks like this car is from the 1940s, uh, 1950s. A 30 to 40 year old car at this point. Wonder how close that I came. In the Indy 500 makes me think like it, it didn't make it to the end. Perhaps it even broke down during the Indy 500. Perhaps that's what killed it. And it's just been there in the junkyard. This car was used and is, is done. Thrown away and has waited in a junkyard for nearly 40 years just to be killed. I took a man to a graveyard. I beg your pardon, it's quite hard enough just living with the stuff I have learned. The, this car has dealt with death. It's a, you know, it's a funeral car, and it knows about death. Kiko, let's go up to Zuma. Kiko, let's go up to Zuma. Uh, Zuma, I believe, is a, is a beach. Pico is the person who used to own this car. Let's go. Let's go back to the beach. Let's do it again. Let's go, let's go back to what we used to do. Pico's not there. Pico's not fucking hanging out in the junkyard with this old car. This car is basically pleading to, like, no, before it dies, no, please, can we, can we go back, please? And then more desperately, Pico, let's go up to Zuma hurried even faster, pleading before it dies. 
And then there's this car. Uh, I'm going to play this one on mute, but the story behind this car is uh, it was on a reservation, a Native American reservation. They all moved away, apparently. Didn't need the car anymore. But what's important is what the car does. I'm going to play it on mute because this is super important. The, ma the magnet comes to pick it up. The car drives onto the conveyor belt. And just fucking lets it happen. That reason, I believe this song nearly got cut from the film. That's the end of the song like with a car offing itself. You're worthless. The end of the song. That's uh, pretty fucking rough. I'm going to talk about the end of the film because there's not actually much else to talk about within the film itself. They get picked up by the master. The master ends up getting stuck on the conveyor belt and he nearly gets crushed until the toaster jams himself in the gears, sacrifices himself and fucking saves them all. The master repairs the toaster, just like we've seen him repair many other things. Look at that. Chris, by the way, is just like, what are you doing? Come on. <laughs> He's like, yeah, sorry. He doesn't say I nearly died. He takes the appliances home and repairs the toaster, drives them away. Uh, wherever he's moving to, really. To college, actually. It is college, yeah. This is the last shot of the movie. They get covered in clouds. Personally, I'm not a big fan of that being the last shot of the movie because I don't really know what like that's supposed to mean. But that's not all there is to talk about uh, because here we're going to get a bit real. I've talked about the director and I've made a point to say the director's name, Jerry Reese. He's still alive. He's not died. That's not the end of the story. He put up a Reddit AMA uh, while I was researching where he talked about this movie and he has a lot of great quotes in it, a lot of great stuff, which I've used in this, in this video. The most important thing about this AMA is the reason it exists. Jerry Reese started working on a sequel that was meant to keep the same emotional, like resonance of the film, treat the characters as real characters, just like this film does, keep them in a dark world. It was meant to feel the same. Whereas the sequels to this movie, to the best of my knowledge, are the ones that actually came out back in like the 90s, didn't. This is in the noughties that he wants to do a sequel. So he was like, right, I'm, I'm taking it back. I want to work on it again. But it turned out the people who ha he, they thought had the rights didn't. Legal issue and they had to work around. He spent years working with the legal team. They got a bunch of really important people <laughs> in the like <laughs> film industry to help out. Eventually had the go ahead, basically, uh, Jerry Reese had the go ahead. The, uh, the people he was working with said, yeah, it's, you can do it. We've got it. Like, we just need to cross some, you know, cross some T's, dot a few I's and, and you can do the movie, which is great. He's written the movie. He's got it, everything great and good to go. You'll notice there has been no movie. The AMA was nine years ago. Some mysterious party, a big company that they, he never found out who it was took the rights out of him, out of, out of, from under him at the last second. There ain't nothing he can do about it. It fits the film, <laughs> weirdly enough. The reason, you know, I'm linking it to the film here. It's almost ironic uh, that this film about these appliances being, you know, replaced by newer, more cutting edge things, didn't get its sequel because the guy that wrote it and directed it was replaced by someone else. It makes me think of these cars at the end of the movie, which are looking back on the things they did. Much like this guy stood in AMA looking back on this film he did and gone, oh, I can't do it anymore. I can't do anything new anymore. You know, this is the end for me. And uh, he's like 66, so he's not too old really to be doing stuff. But in terms of like how the industry works, I don't think he's going to be directing any new movies. So that's it for him. Let me get on to my views about death and why I think it's so important uh, that this song is filled with these guys telling their stories. Throughout my life, when, I, when I've lost people, I see there's, there's a sadness there, right? <laughs> we're, we're talking about death. Sorry, guys. We get nothing new out of these people when you lose them. You lose a loved one, you get no more time with them. That's the sad thing. You want to make more memories with them. That's when you want to start learning new things about them, right? You want to listen to stories that you weren't there for from, from people you know. You keep them alive by sharing your stories with other people, right? In a way, I kind of I kind of view this as the same thing. It, it sounds stupid. I know to to liken losing a loved one to not being able to make a new film but i mean this this whole film has been about reaching the end of something and becoming obsolete and not being able to do anything with it and i think in that way they've been an allegory for that human experience everyone reaches a point where they're done that's kind of why i want to do this why i've done this thing 
and, it, and it's linked to my, my view on endings then not necessarily death you finish something you're done but you can still share it there's still plenty of people out there who will experience it for the first time you can at least take the time you've already had and share that around give that to new people that doesn't really link with appliances because once they're done they're done but you can go around and share this thing right I wasn't sure if this is a bit melodramatic to end it on for a film about a toaster. Throughout this entire movie, the writer and director treated it real and, and with respect. What I think is the prototype to Pixar, you see, almost set a precedent for kids' movies being treated with proper respect. And I like that. That's the way it should be. That's why I want to sit here, talk about this fucking movie for two hours, and mention <laughs> and, and compare it to dying and <laughs> losing a loved one. Much like consumerism and throwing shit away when you're done with it, I think the attitude we should have towards people in our lives and towards everything should be to keep it alive, you know? That's the brave little toaster. That's what it's about to me. It, that's where all this darkness uh, ends up finishing on a shot of clouds and what I would say is literally the perspective of the sun, right? Maybe that's it. This is the perspective of the sun the biggest light there is, and we've talked about light, and we've talked about hope, not giving up on something, and, and, and that, that's, that's what we're doing here. So that's the stupid, sappy, melodramatic ending I'm, I'm giving to this. Thank you for watching. We're not finishing the stream just yet because I do have to go and do some loot in Terraria. And yeah, this was a great time. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really did. I'm glad I could share this stupid movie and talk about and hopefully convince you as to why I find it so important. Are you sluts? <laughs>